Hello and welcome to the July 2024 Gold Sim webinar. My name is Jason and I am, uh, I decided to <clears throat> talk about the mass balance um, functionality of um, a particular model that we have in our library um, because it is something that you would want to include probably in most uh, most any system model that is uh, simulating flows and storages. Um, and it's a good way to verify the results of your model and um, provide a way to know that you can rely on the, um, the results that you're seeing. So what I'll do is uh, first introduce the model um, and then talk about how it can be implemented into a into a real um, model that simulates flows and storages. So the model can be found in our library, and that is here in the Help Center. And if you go to the, the main page, go to Model Library Applications, and then under Water Management, you'll see we have it pinned up here at the top, check for mass balance closure. And uh, then you can scroll down and download it here. Um, so that's what I've done. I'm going to now close this and uh, show my uh, couple of models here. The one on the right shows the mass balance model that came from that website. So at the top level, you see we just have a, just an example model that allows you to see how it works briefly, that this is basically what we have in the mass balance check model. So <clears throat> um, there's also, if you go, if you open up the note pane, I can't remember if the latest version has it in a note pane down here. This, all of this text might also be in the, in the body of the, uh, the model as well. But um, anyway, so, in here, it describes everything that's going on, but I will just walk through it briefly. So <clears throat> it's kind of also important to kind of consider a model before totally understanding what is going on in the mass balance. But essentially what we have are three components. We have inflows going into the system. We have outflows leaving the system. And then we have the amount of store, the total amount of storage. You uh, you add these up, and you should expect there. To, you should expect you should expect the answer to be zero on every time step. When I say add them up, what I mean is it's it's actually inflows, less outflows, less changes in storage over the simulation period. And so flows are a rate, right? And the amount of storage in the system is not a rate, it is an accumulation of rates, so it's a volume or a mass. Um, so <clears throat> to uh, so you have to think about these all of these components in terms of integrated amounts over time. And since storage is already um, an integrated uh, amount, then we just simply need to integrate the inflows and the outflows. But it's really important that it's done this way um, with these integrators. It's really important that we put the inflows and outflows through these integrators because <clears throat> what could happen if we didn't do that is that you could have uh, you could have calculations that are happening outside of your uh, scheduled time step. So if you have inserted time steps, um, then you might make a you might make it the wrong assumption about how much water is flowing in or out of your system. So with integrators, it captures everything even during unscheduled update times. So <clears throat> this model then integrates the flows, and then it takes the change in volume. What that means is look at our initial starting volume and then from that subtract, take the difference between that and the current volume at any point in time and that is your change in volume. And then the 
overall equation is here, cumulative inflows minus cumulative outflows minus change in volume. This should be very near zero. What you'll find is that it doesn't go exactly to zero because we have some numerical errors due to round off. But those are very small on the order of 10 to the negative between 12 and even smaller than that. So if we're talking about one unit, of uh, material. So because of that, because the value is not exactly zero, we use, uh, in a, we use a threshold, um, an allowable error that we allow for. And then if we exceed that allowable error, then we trigger warnings and or errors. And we do that with a script element. This is all, uh, this is, this is all not, completely necessary uh, to have these warnings. I like it. It's a convenience for me because um, if you're if you do run into an error, usually it's at a time when you didn't expect it. Perhaps you made a small change to the model. Suddenly something isn't being accounted for or perhaps you're losing mass in your system. We want to know immediately when that might begin to happen. And so that's why I've included this error handling component. OK. So that's basically it. Um, you just have to build your model and preferably while you're building your model, incorporate this mass balance and then just add your inflows, outflows and your storages to these highlighted yellow elements. And then everything should be taken care of when you're using this. But let me walk through how we do that, because there's some things that um, might be nice to be able to see. OK, so what what I'll do then is I'll just expand this model on the left to incorporate the mass balance. So this model, and I'll just start over here. So this model, um, it just is a simple system. And let me expand this. And what it has is it has three pools in it. It has a pool here, pool one, that's receiving an inflow from the outside. And then water from here is sent into two different directions. First of all, there's a there's a an outflow that we've defined that goes to a splitter. Some of some of this flow is then split off and goes over to this storage. And then we have <clears throat> I'm gonna we don't need that. And then we have uh, a flow that leaves this uh, pool three. It goes into a material delay and then back over to pool one. Meanwhile, pool one has a an upper bound defined. So an overflow might occur, and any overflows go over here to pool one, or sorry, to pool two. So we just have this, we have a flow cycle here, and then we have another flow cycle down here. But also, there is, uh, at each of these pools, we have multiple outflows. So at this pool, we have an evaporation loss plus the recycle flow that comes back around. And each, each of the other two pools also have evaporation occurring. So when we're talking about mass balance, the most important thing is to consider the boundary. And so I'm just going to draw a boundary around um, my system just for graphical purposes. So I'll draw this and let me change it to something like this. Okay, so this is our boundary. And what we want to capture are the inflows and outflows that cross that line, that imaginary line. And those are the inflows and outflows of our mass balance, right? So. We already see one, this is obvious, the inflow one, that's that's a flow that comes in. But I mentioned that each of these pools have evaporation occurring. So those are essentially arrows that are, those are, those are leaving. So we could go around and we could draw this to be um, exact if we wanted to, you know, go around and draw those. But that's essentially what's happening is we have, we have things leaving there. We also have areas that, we might not be 
we, we have flows leaving the system, but we don't care about them. But we do care about them when we're doing a mass balance check, right? This splitter is splitting flows in two directions, but we're only showing one. And that's because we have, maybe this is a waste stream or something. It's something we just aren't including in the model, but that is important to keep in mind that that is um, contributing to the mass balance, right? So <clears throat> typically what I like to do, even if we're not modeling it, is just to capture every single flow and always make sure to do that very rigorously. So by doing it, it just makes it very clear. So I just connected to that output there. So now we can see. Now I probably wouldn't do the same thing for evaporation. Maybe you have many ponds in your system and it would just clutter the model to show evaporation leaving every single um, of storage element. But we could do a similar thing with expressions like this that show the, the flow leaving. And then you'd probably want to give this a name or something like that. Um, so we this helps, um, definitely helps to visualize the mass balance when you capture all of those things. Another, something else I did in this model is I have information that's being passed from this pool over to this pool. And that information is essentially a request. So this is a very common in a gold sim model like this, where typically you have uh, one storage that is talking to some other storage or maybe there's a component somewhere like a pump or something you're trying to model that what it's doing is it's monitoring the state of another store and it says okay when when that store is low then we need to turn on something and send water over things like that and so when you do that kind of thing um for me, it's important to delineate those in a way that highlights them as not being a flow, that this is information. So I just changed the color of this, of this line. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's helpful. Um, another way you could do this, which I've described in other webinars is to create a reference to this uh, information that's up one level. Uh, so right now, if you look over in our browser, over here, um, you can see here that our system, our model is down one level. So we could put um, this information, a reference to this information up one level and then bring it back down into here. That would remove this line. Uh, I often do those kinds of things, but changing the color also helps. Regardless, it's nice to see your overall system and where everything is moving around. Um, then also delineating information, making those different. Um, if I were to copy and paste this entire set of elements into a new container, then you'll lose these uh, uh, changes that you made, these, these one-off changes that you've made to these uh, influence lines. So just keep that in mind. Well, I don't know if that's exactly always true, copying and pasting. Um, it could be, it depends actually on the scenario, but if you, it, uh, oftentimes when the model has to reparse all of these um, and because you've pasted it into a different place, then these customized links will then go back to their default. So just keep that in mind. Um, all right, so <clears throat> here is our, Here's our system with the line, and we're also keeping in mind in the back of our minds that, well, we have evaporation also leaving. But this should account for everything. So this is the, the, this is the most important part of building a model with a mass balance check, is to just visualize it and walk through it visually and try to understand where are the inflows and outflows and where are your changes in storage and i've been mentioning here that i have three storages but that's not actually true there are four um, storages in this model the fourth one is a material delay so <clears throat> a material delay uh, because it's delaying things it must be holding something inside of it for a little while until it gets released 
That's just the way it is. Um, a material delay element operates in a way that you might envision a conveyor belt, um, but it could also do dispersion, which is a little different. But essentially, we've got some amount of material or water held up in transit during any given time step because of the delay. So that means we actually have four storage elements in this model that need to be accounted for to do this mass balance properly. Okay, so now I'm going to bring the mass balance container over here just by copying it. Copy. Okay, I, I want to put this mass balance uh, container up here at the at the top level. By the way, you see I also put evaporation rate up here. If I put the evaporation rate down here, then you see that suddenly the model becomes much more complicated to, to look at. So that's why I put that at that top level. Um, <clears throat> after you do a move like that, or after you copy and paste or do any kind of major move to your model, I highly recommend that you update your expressions manually. You could also run the model. That also causes the model to update all of its expressions. But I just kind of have a habit of typing the F9 key, which is update expressions. After I do simple maneuvers like what I just did by moving that element outside, I like to do those. I just have a habit of it um, because there could be times where the model doesn't parse and you move something to a different place. Then you have you have errors or not errors, but you have links that haven't been updated. Then if you don't update the expressions and then you change a name of something that isn't updated yet, then you could get an error when you do go to run the model and you'll see the name not appear. So usually uh, when you do major operations like copy and paste, the parsing automatically will occur when you paste. Um, but since it's just an F9 key, it's very easy to make a habit of always updating your expressions when you do major moves like that. Okay, so I copied that mass balance to the clipboard, so I'm just going to paste it here. And like I said, it'll be messy for a little while, just while I'm kind of going back and forth looking at things, but then I'm going to move this up one level. Okay, so already we have a connection here from the inflow one into the mass balance. Um, and that's just because it just it just is a coincidence that I have the same name, inflow one, that was used in the example that it came with. So that's why there's already a connection going on right there. But if I click, if I type F9, then you'll see there's a whole bunch of broken links, and these all happen to be inside of this mass balance check as well. And that's just because it carried over some some links that it had, and they're all contained within these inflows and outflows, except for a discrete change. Um, but let's not. I'll, I'll talk about the discrete change here in a minute. Okay. So what I want to do now is now that I have this um, this mass balance model in here now I will make the connections so I'll go in here to the inflows and I'll add a, I'll just connect in all of my inflows coming through into our system I only have one so that one looks okay and then the outflows I don't have that one I'll remove it and then I'll start I'll add the outflow that I just created this one called waste and then we have those evaporation rates so I'll just add each of those And the nice thing about the pool element is that you can define multiple outflows in the pool, and they're all contained in this folder called outflows. You can see here it is evaporation. So I'll do the same thing for pools two and three. So there's all there are all of our outflows. Okay, it turns out that the example that that uh, came with this also had a discrete change. This was just showing how if you do have discrete changes, it's not as common, but sometimes you do. If you have discrete changes that are moving 
quantities of water from one place to another in your system on a discrete basis, then you would also have to include those. And they can be easily added um, just by clicking on this thing here and just adding as many discrete changes as you have. I'm going to delete it though. I, you can also just delete it, just type it, and highlight it and delete it there. But I make sure, I just wanna make sure I don't have any discrete changes. Okay, next is the volumes. And I'll start with the current volumes. So remember we have four of them. So I'll add the pools. The first one, second one, third one. There's the three pools. And then we need to go to the material delay. And it turns out the material delay has a secondary output. So the main output of a material delay is the flow. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the amount in transit. That is an automatic uh, secondary output that comes with the material delay. Okay, so that looks good. And now the initial volumes. Now this one, um, typically you want your initial volumes to be defined outside of the pool, but sometimes they're just, if they're typed in like this, you're just, you have no choice but to just essentially copy and paste that number into the mass balance for the initial um, volume. So if I go here to initial volume, then I would just put in 220 like that. Obviously this is kind of a, this is a very brittle way to build your model. Uh, if I ever make a change, to that initial volume, then we've got a problem. So definitely what you'd wanna do is create a data element that defines the initial volume outside, call it initial volume, and then link it here, right here. Um, I'm not doing it right now because I'm just trying to keep this simple, but if you start, do, when you start doing that kind of thing, then you start, cluttering again the model so I did that with pool one that's why it's in a container if I open up this container you'll see it has all these other things going on and I just lumped them all together and put them into a container and made sure that also that it's a localized container by the way and then we'd probably want to repeat that for these others but in the meantime I'll just leave them as is this one does not have an initial quantity so we don't need to worry about that one or it's a zero also the material delay can have an initial outflow. We would need to account for that, multiplying it by the delay time if we had an initial outflow. However, because we're using dispersion, this gets more complicated. So if you happen to have a model with material delays and an initial outflow and a dispersion, then we probably need to talk because it it's complicated the way that we have an initial state. But that's very rare, uh, typically typically with the material delay, um, just because it is, it is mostly, most of the time going to be a simplification of something more complicated, like maybe seepage into groundwater, you know, some sort of groundwater flow that you might expect to come in later on, something like that is typically what a material delay is for. Or another thing it's used for is to break a recursive loop. So you can see here we have, kind of a cycle of flows going back and forth between pool one and pool two. And because this is an overflow going over here, that's an instantaneous. Therefore, any backflows coming back over here would cause a circular loop. So to break that, I'm using a material delay. So if you're just doing it for that one purpose, just to break that loop, then you probably don't have a delay defined here. It would be just zero. It would obviously delay it by just one day, but you also probably wouldn't have dispersion. Um, a lot of times you might think, well, I could just use a previous value. Um, the problem with using a previous value to break circular logic like this is um, that it, it causes a problem with this mass balance. Um, it doesn't track the quantity that is being delayed by the one time step because it's a previous value. So you'd have to account for that. Um, it can be done, but it's um, 
a little more complicated and it gets more complicated if you have inserted time steps. So the best way to do it is definitely a material delay. If you're working with flows going around in a loop and you need to break the recursive loop, then definitely a material delay is the way to go. Um, okay, but we don't have an initial outflow, so I don't need to account for that. And then if we go to pool one, you see it has this data element called initial pool and that's being defined here. So now I'm just going to refer to initial pool in my mass balance. So I'm going back over here to the mass balance, go over here to my initial volume, and then I add the initial pool from pool one. Okay, so now I think I have everything. Uh, we will find out here when I run the model. Okay, so seeing that the model runs to completion tells me that the there is no mass balance error. Uh, we could look at, I have a mass balance history here, and I have a mass balance error uh, plot. So the mass balance error plot is just showing you the result of this MB equation, which is this equation we talked about, that should be close to zero. And you can see here it is very close to zero. And that does not trigger an event. We can look at this. It says completion status false. We did not get any errors. And then over here we can see a plot of total inflows, total outflows, and the change in volume. Okay, um, <clears throat> now let's see what happens when we introduce a small error. And one way we could do that is we could say, Oh, later on in the model, you know, I'm building this model and I realize that this pool two needs to have an initial quantity. But before I make these changes, I'm going to move this mass balance up one level. Okay, so everything is still connected. And you can see that some of these elements now have a different symbol on their ports. So the input port and the output port. Not all of them had this little dot before, but now they do because they are now talking to the mass balance check calculations that is outside of this container. And when you have outputs going to a place outside of the container, this is the symbol that is used to indicate that. Okay, and if we go up a level, you'll see here's the, there's the information being passed over. All right, um, so the next thing I want to do now is, let's say I want to add 10 here as the starting initial quantity. And now when I run the model, I get this message. It says a mass balance error of negative 10 cubic meters starting on elapsed day zero. So we didn't even advance anywhere into the model and we already have this message. And let's say it's a very complicated model and we were doing a lot of things and we didn't realize at what point we made this change. The nice thing about having this kind of error messaging is that it gives you more clues um, telling you that if we have this error occurring on elapsed day zero, then that means we're not talking about flows because flows need to accrue over time. Um, Although if we did have a mismatch in flow, it actually it would it would trigger on day zero. But the fact that um, it has uh, this this value of this cubic meters that looks suspiciously familiar, um, then one thing we could do is go around and look for where did we define you know this this number. Um, but usually in a real model, it's a little more complicated than that. Usually we're not just um, referring to just a single value that someone typed in. Usually there's another equation going on that then, you know, maybe it's going to through a lookup table and generating a value. And so this number might be, you know, more complicated or it might be um, not as easy to track it back to where it happened. Um, so I'll get into some strategies on how to make it easier to zero in on where the problem might be. Um, but what I wanted to make note of is how we came up with that messaging. How did that messaging occur? Because Goldson doesn't really know um, how much to report this kind of thing. We had to build all that in. So what I have here for the, for the error handling is I have a milestone. 
if I open up this milestone element, the way the milestone works is it's just waiting for something to occur to trigger it, and then its output becomes true. The output I'm talking about is, if I click on the output port, is this completion status. We're waiting for the moment when that becomes true, and if that does, then it triggers some things. So my completion status here currently says false, but when I run it, then now it says true. We can also uh, get the, the date and the elapsed time on which that occurred. You can see here that it says it happened on day zero. The other thing about the, and, and the nice thing about the milestone, the reason I like to use the milestone is that you have this ability to just worry about the first time that it gets triggered because the way that mass balance works is you could have errors at every single time step and we don't want to report every single t occurrence of an error if that's the case that's just too many we just need to know if it occurs one time so that's the beauty of using the milestone element in this case there are other ways to do it too you don't have to use a milestone i mean we could just use an if statement but you'd have to couch it in another if statement that says um well anyway it's more complicated but we could certainly do it the milestone is just very handy for this kind of thing okay so this just is true or false that's all it's doing it's a reporting a true or false if oh and i didn't show the trigger so here's the trigger so the trigger for this milestone just says um, every day I want you to do a specific check and that check is is the absolute value of our mass balance greater than our allowable error right now it's set for one liter that's pretty big it's a much larger value than the, the numerical error that we were seeing so you could make that allowable error much smaller if you wanted to but is the absolute value of it greater than that? And if it is, then this triggers. Okay, but then I use a script element to perform the messaging and logging that we were seeing. So once again, running the model, we have a message appearing here. This is coming from the script element. The next thing we have is a warning that's recorded during the simulation in the run log. That is also something that is being generated by the script element. If I click yes, then we see my, this just a log file, the text editor. It says down here, warnings and errors, script warning. So that's telling us it's coming from the script element and it's set up as a warning type of log. Mass balance error is here. So this is the same exact uh, message that we saw in the uh, in the little pop-up okay so let's go to the script element and talk about how that's done I have an exception handle type data element that I've created that specifies one two or three you can define a one two or three here and um, I did this because sometimes you want the model to be interrupted and just go back to edit mode immediately if you ever get a an error like this but other times when you're debugging and building the model and so forth you want it to run to completion and just not worry about it right now if that's the case then you would set it to a two or a three if you set it to three it doesn't even show a message and, and interrupt the model at all it just puts a log it just writes it into the log at the end so these are the three different types and then if we go into the script element then what we do here is we, um, I, I have some things here for dates, for dealing with dates. And this is really useful for if you have a date time simulation and you want to know the month, the day, and the year when the error might have occurred because it's a date time simulation based on a calendar. So this is useful. <clears throat> In those cases but my model is an elapsed time model so i really don't care about this so we can just ignore that for now but just keep in mind that if you have a date time simulation then you might want to report on the month the day and the year of occurrence 
the reason for that is that they are being used in the logs and the messaging down here, or they could be. Okay, so we have this if statement that says, if our milestone, that's this milestone here, MB error event, if the milestone and then dot completion status, remember that is the output, that true or false output, so if there's an error, essentially, this is, this is asking if there's an error, then, then it goes into these different types. So if you're going to do a type one that, that interrupts the model, stops the model, and it becomes invalid, and you cannot complete the simulation, and it shows you this message and also would put it in the log as an error. And we're using special syntax to reach into the model and get the value of specific um, elements. And you can see it, it talks about it up here, how to do it. You use a curly braces with an equal sign, put in the name of the variable with another curly brace. That's how you reference variable outputs within the messaging or log statements of the script element. So then we say mass balance error of, and then we put in here curly braces equal sign, and one thing to keep in mind, and it's just the way it is, that when you're referencing variables this way, it will show you the SI unit, the value in the SI unit, period. That's all it's going to do. So if you're dealing with gigaliters, megaliters, acre feet, or something, you know, really large numbers like that, then it's going to show you in cubic meters, because that's the SI unit. Um, so, in, if, in a case of, let's say I'm using a very large um, unit here of, uh, let's say, gigaliters, then I would want to put gigaliters here. This is a casting of unit. That's what these vertical bars are. It casts the unit off. So whatever gigaliters this mass balance amount was, then I will um, convert that to just a non-unit with of gigaliters converted so that it shows you the value in terms of gigaliters. Then you'd want to come over here and type in gigaliters right there so that the message would show you that. It is, it's a manual thing that you have to do. It's just the way it is um, to deal with this conversion of SI units in the messaging. So there's a little bit that you would have to do here. Uh, please do let me know if this is confusing or if you have questions about that. But it's essentially just a way to show you a value that might be difficult to read if it's in SI units. You can just cast it off in, it, in the, whatever unit you're interested in and make sure you display it in the text there. And then I say, starting on elapsed day, this. Um, now, now, like I said earlier, we could change this to starting on year, month, day, right? We could change this to year, month, day. And then in here, we could then, instead of referring to E-day, we could refer to these things we've created up here month, day, year of that occurrence. Um, also keep in mind that if you see the tilde symbol before a variable name, unlike this one, then that means it's referring either to one of two things. First, it will look for run properties that have this. Um, well, that's actually, I don't know if that would be first, but this, this either refers to run properties of your model or it refers to variables inside of the script if you use this tilde symbol. So if you don't use it, it's going to look into, it's going to reach into the model, find your variable names in the model. If you use this tilde symbol, it's either looking in here in the script for variables or it's looking at your run properties of your model. And this, in this case, I don't have an e-day in my script, it's looking at the run property of E-Day. Okay, so these are just inserted, these log errors show log warning, all these, these are just inserted by going here to insert and then picking one of these three things. So log error, that's the first one, and that causes the simulation to be uh, terminated or paused and then terminated. These other ones allow the simulation to continue, but they do uh, message either immediately on the screen and with a pop-up, um, or they log it. Well, they actually all log. All of these will log. Uh, they'll write to the log, but it's just how they message it um, to you during the simulation that's different. Okay, so that's how the script element is working. If this is just too complicated for what you're doing, you don't need all of that. You could just use an interrupt element, so that's why this is here. 
the interrupt element is a little simpler and much easier to use. All you have to do is just come in here and say, okay, at the time that we have, um, at the exact time that we have our first event occur of our mass balance error, then just interrupt the model and display this message. And in this messaging, we cannot use the syntax like this. It doesn't, it's not, it's not allowed. So that's the one benefit of using the script element is you are able to reference model variables in that way, unlike this interrupt element. Okay, so that's how we um, handle it. And <clears throat> there's two ways to have errors in the, in the mass balance. Um, <clears throat> one way is that you do what I did, which is you accidentally add something that's not being accounted for. Adding this, however, does not does not uh, invalidate, I guess, the flow system that we're modeling. There's still there's still uh, accounting of or the the mass is all there. There's we're not losing mass. We're not adding mass to the system uh, incorrectly. Everything is still operating correctly, but our reporting system will report an error because we did not account for it. So that's one way to have a mass balance error. And that's, unfortunately, that can be frustrating because you, your model might be totally correct, but you're reporting something that's incorrect. Your, 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 your reporting system is saying, oh, hey, there's a problem. You have, a, you have an error. But the only reason you have that is because, because you forgot to account for it. So just forgetting to do that, right? So that's one way to have an error. So that's, that's probably the most common, but another way to have an error, go back over to the model. Another way to run into this type of error is to actually do that problem of sending water, you know, making it so there is not a mass balance all of a sudden. And that would be something like saying, oh yeah, I have another flow that goes over from pool two to pool three. And so you add one, let's say we add one here, and then it's supposed to go over to pool three and then we forget to add it. And so now we have just this hanging outflow just sitting here, this one right here, that's going who knows where and um, also not being accounted for. Um, so there's that, there's also that type of error. And if we run this model, then you'll see that here, here's an error that's already occurring, uh, at day zero. And you can see that this number, it's telling us 0.04. So we can't really go around the model and look for 0.04, um, because that's not how this is defined, this outflow. It's actually one cubic meter per day. Um, so that's why the, the amount that we're showing may not necessarily correlate exactly, at least it, from what you're expecting it to see um, as the error itself. So you have to think in terms of, okay, how much is it off throughout the rest of the simulation? And so let's do that. Let's go back to our, um, whoops, let's go back to our mass balance. And now let's change this error handling type to three so that we don't have to worry so much about these messages that keep popping up all the time right now and run the model. And it says, okay, a warning was um, recorded. So that now it's just informing us that the something was written to the run log. We'll say, okay, there. And now we know that there is an error and how do we find it? So if we, if we plot the mass balance error, we see something like this and so what that's telling us is that we're accruing mass balance error at the beginning of the simulation up until about day five, and then nothing's changing until about day 55, and then it starts going up again. So that is a good clue um, that could help us. So one thing we might wanna do is compare this to our storage. If we look at our storage overall, the total storage, that's the green line change in storage. It's not really telling us very much. 
But what we could do is we could start looking at some of the individual components of the model. For example, what is the storage of this pool? We see that it has volume up until about day five, and then it has nothing until just past day 55. So that turns out to correspond very nicely with our error that we're seeing right here. And if I were to look at other pools, other um, storages, these do not line up. When there's no accrual of error, we still have things going on at this pool. So that kind of rules out these other pools. Let's go to this one and just see. This one, this one um, is changing all the time except for right here. So from looking at the way that these ponds are operating, that does give us a really good clue as to which one we should focus on to find the problem. So this is a pretty good strategy um, to just keep the mass balance open, look at what look at the shape of the the mass balance error, and that tells you a lot of things. Previously, we had an error that only occurred at the very beginning, and that's a good indicator that we're talking about initial values. But this type of error where we show that there's no accrual of error during a certain period means that whatever we're looking at is probably not doing anything during that period. And that's definitely this pool one. So that would be a good way to zero in on where the problem might be occurring. So that would be this one. Okay, so um, there are some other strategies you can think about and use to uh, help help debug your model and find out the root of your problems in, with the mass balance check. But one other thing that I wanted to mention is that's really useful when you have a very large model with many different components. Sometimes when you first, if you were to take that model that's already been built, it's already been built out, so it's huge, you draw this line around this big thing and you add them all up and you still have an error and you can't figure out where it is, a really good strategy is to have many little sub um, components look at the uh, mass balance. So you might just take just this part right here. Let's do the mass balance on just this part and then do it on just this other part and so forth. Um, and then it's good. It's a good idea. To, you might have multiple mass balance checks in your model. Um, and then you would just come out here and you would just have copies of this. You'd have mini mass balances. Um, the, the benefit of doing that is that in the future, if you ever run into a mass balance error, it points you to the exact location, the specific area that a mass balance might have occurred. And these are the mass balance is something that is useful for debugging and getting your model ready. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that stays in there. Uh, once you go into production mode and hand the model off to your to your client, but if you change if you plan to make a lot of changes to flows and how they're being driven, then I would say you definitely want to keep the mass balance in there. Okay, so that concludes the presentation. I hope that was useful. Um, I do, I, I will wait around a little to ask, uh, answer any questions that you might have, but otherwise, um, hopefully we'll see you next, uh, actually, let's see, um, yeah, hopefully, yeah, we will have one more next month, and then in September, we'll, we will be hosting our user conference here in Seattle, and I highly recommend that you check it out um, re and register if you haven't already, and uh, hopefully we will be able to meet you in person. So thanks for joining us, and um, we'll see you next month. And again, yeah, I'll wait around here to see if there are any questions. Um, somebody asked, what if we want to track mass of radioactive elements? Oh, well, that's a good question. In relation to initial mass in the same time, if some mass is lost, can we track how much is lost by decay only? Um, okay, so this would be a, this would be a good question for Rick, uh, who uh, knows a lot more than I do about radionuclide um, uh, 
transport and that is a different module in gold sim um and i am not sure i could answer that very intelligently right now unfortunately so i'll have to defer that but um i will i will ask rick and see what he says but i don't know if you've played around with uh radionuclide transport module but that's this if you click on this uh icon right here um you, that's a module that you'd have to purchase. If you don't have it, um, then, well, perhaps you could look at a trial. You could probably uh, access a trial license um, and see what you think. But this does allow you to define um, uh, elements that have, when I say, well, it allows you to define species that um, are, are decaying and decay into other products, daughter products. Um, that you can also specify. So that's kind of a different type of um, application um, that probably is different from what we've been talking about, I think. But it, but there might be tools in there to help you ensure that you uh, maintain a, a balance in that in that way. And that should be something that's already taken care of for you using that module. So I hope that hope that answers your question. I know it doesn't really answer your question exactly, but I hope it helps. Um, but yeah, I am happy to go and talk to uh, talk to Rick about that, and I can get back with you. Okay, somebody asked. I assume the same technique works for tracking mass and load. Yeah, so I was using, I was I was looking every everything here is volumes and and volumetric flows, but certainly we could do the same exact thing with mass for sure. Yep. In fact, I would say you could, if you if you have a model that includes rates of change like this, with um, any kind of amounts being integrated over time like we're doing it doesn't even matter what the unit is at all it could be items it could be cars it could be money so it it's uh it doesn't matter what it is the same the the all of the concepts would be exactly the same somebody asked do we really need mass balance check for ct modules and that is a really good question um I would say no for the mass that we are tracking within the cell pathways because that's the whole point of the module is to track the mass of all of that. Um, however, if we are talking about the media in which the mass of contaminants is uh, passing through, that's what I'm talking about. So. That is a good question, and thank you for bringing that up. Because what that means is the the question back going back to the mass of radioactive elements. Um, yeah, so that in that case, if we're using the module, then it's um, inherently the mod. That's the that's the job of this module is to um, keep track of the mass. But that's a different kind of mass. I mean, it's not a different kind. To the model, it's it's a different it's a different animal. So uh, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the medium of water. Okay, so there might be contaminants in the medium of water. Th that would be, we're tracking those contaminants using CT or RT, but that's different than the medium in which it is being mixed and diffused in. I'm talking about the medium. So water that's flowing around, you know, that we're linking together with these elements. That's the mass that I'm talking, mass or volume that I'm talking about. Thank you for bringing that up, that's a good point. And somebody else um, said, uh, thanks, this was helpful, especially in understanding how to add the changes due to uh, pool and material delays. Yeah, that's um, 
that is something that's kind of overlooked is uh, it, when it comes to delays, it's not typically something we think about that there's, oh, there's mass, you know, there's, there's a quantity in there that's being, that's accumulating. It is leaving too, but there is some quantity in there that we need to keep track of. Yeah.